Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. All right, here we go. What you think about. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I hope you enjoyed our opening music. It's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, featuring my adore, and you can download it on any of your favorite music platforms if you like. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer's Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to have real conversations with real people um, that are in the trenches at all levels. So think about being our guest. We love to talk to those who are diagnosed, family members and professionals that care and serve them, as well as advocates and researchers and so much more. Today, our conversation is going to be about language and dementia, and we are so lucky to have Kathy Braxton back with us. And this is a live show, so you can call in and join the conversation at 323 870-4602. That's 323-870-4602. But before I formally introduce uh, Kathy, I always like to do a few shout outs. So I want to do a shout out for um, Susan McFadden. She is going to be doing a free event um, April 8th from 12 to 1, and it is with the Fry Art Museum in partnership with Aging Wisdom and the University of Washington uh, Memory and Brain Wellness Center. And again, that'll be on uh, Thursday, April 8th from 12 to 1 o'clock. They're going to be talking about um, dementia-friendly communities, and uh, Susan McFadden and her husband, John, have just done so much work in Wisconsin around this. You know, I hope that you take advantage of this. And then uh, we're going to have Susan on the show um, April 13th, which is a Tuesday, so we'll be able to learn even more from her then. And I also want to give a plug for Emerald Crest with um, with Cassia. Uh, we are going to be doing a um, presentation uh, together, and we are going to be talking about uh, dementia map and uh, exploring ways to find a variety of dementia resources because, again, we all know you can't know what you don't know. And so that'll be April 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m., and that'll be Central Time, and you can contact Christine Dasher, Drasher, I'm sorry, at 952-856-7521, or you can just go to uh, Emerald Crest um, is well dot com, Emerald Quest, uh, Emerald Crest dot com for more information there. I always like to also give a shout out to the Memory Cafe directory. Um, you know, most of them are virtual, but some are talking about coming back in person again. So you can find out all of those by going to memorycafedirectory.com. And, of course, I invite you to join me at Arthur's Memory Cafe, which is um, sponsored by Arthur's Senior Living on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. Uh, we are still virtual. We haven't talked about meeting in person yet. Uh, And that is at 1 o'clock Central Time. If you'd like more information, you can go ahead and email me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. And then, of course, the Dementia Map, you can get uh, lots of resources and find out about events, uh, both free and and fee-based. There, we just added a a glossary of terms, which is really helpful. Just go to DementiaMap.com. And then Coral Faith, of course is still 
so, I just love them to death. They are still allowing people to download Music First and Choral Faith free during the pandemic. We're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker, and then we're going to be right back with Kathy Braxton talking about language and dementia. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The Foot Bar Walker opens and closes just like a standard walker. The only thing that is different is the top bar and the foot bar. Does that ever make a difference? Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's the thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, we are back, and I'm um, proud to say again, we're going to have Kathy Braxton with us. She's been a past guest who has always, who is always welcomed on the show. She always has wonderful, wonderful insights, and I know today is not going to be any different. Now, for those of you that don't know Kathy, um, she is the owner, educator, and content creator of Improv for Caregivers, formerly uh, Silver Dawn. Some of you might know her also with Dementia Raw. And um, she is just uh, she's just wonderful in terms of how she looks at things. And she's very unapologetic for her style, which allows caregivers to really dig in deep to empathy and um, improv. And she provides this safe space and she's open to all conversations. And that is really one of the reasons I just adore her, you know, being with us because we can have a real conversation and no one is saying everything has to be one way or the other. And she's very, very open-minded and um, a very skilled facilitator and, and thought provoker. So, you know, Kathy, I just want to thank you so much for taking time. I know your day is just as busy as mine. And I really appreciate you um, being with us today. So thanks for thanks and welcome for being with us today. Thank you. And thanks for that lovely endorsement. That really uh, made my head really swell. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good, good. You know, you don't have to go outside, so don't worry about having to fit through the door right now. But I, I believe <laughs> everything I said, um, I do. I just adore you and your your style and your openness in terms of uh, in creativity when it comes to looking at dementia. Now, I'd like you to give people a little background because um, I always ask all our guests, no matter how many times they've been on the show, we always have new listeners. And just tell people if you've been personally touched or affected by any form of dementia in your in your own family or circle of friends. Sure. So um, actually, I do have uh, dementia. We're never really quite sure um, which type. Um, that has affected both sides of my family, both my mother and my father's side. Um, And I myself um, have had two traumatic brain injuries, so I have some um, mild cognitive impairment myself that I live with and try to work through every single day. And so when you described what I teach and what I do and what I'm willing to talk about, absolutely there is nothing off the table because this affects me on a personal level for myself. Um, Not only am I able to look at um, how we care for persons with dementia from a different perspective, just because I think I have a very unique concept where, you know, we do need to be much more open in dialogue and talking about what's really going going on and not glossing over and, and giving, like you said, sound bites, but real sound advice. Um, but on a personal level too, I see how it affects me. I see how it affects my family. I see how my family interacts with me. And so I have that different perspective as kind of a person who I wouldn't say is living with dementia per se, but certainly can step into that at certain points in time and see it from a different way. And it really mm-hmm. enlightens me and helps me to kind of, probe in and find more deep content that I think we can share with caregivers. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you. Let's, uh, you know, we're going to talk about language today, and, and it is such uh, such an impactful thing when it comes to our relationships. And I think a lot of times we see um, language as just being words, but there's all kinds of, of different language out there through our nonverbals that we use to com- to co- ugh, we use to communicate as well. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about how the use of language impacts our own internal thoughts and um, yeah. our internal dialogue um, without, you know, opening our lips, but just what's going on in that pea brain of ours <laughs> spinning around. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, language is like really, it is the key to making connection. It is the key to, it is the key to communication, honestly. And that package of communication like you said, doesn't just include verbalizations. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that that's the most important way to communicate is by using words. Um, And I think we're going to dive a little bit into that today. But what's interesting is when it comes to a package of communication um, and you think about a way in which describing a situation or sharing a story or sharing a situation, um, The most impactful part of that package of communication is, in fact, body language and facial expressions. Um, That's 59% of what a package of communication is is all about. The importance of it lies within body language. And then the other 35% of a package of communication is truly conveyed through tone and pitch and inflection. So it's how we raise and lower our voice, how we put an emphasis on a word. And then at the end, it's only 7% of verbalizations that convey that, that true concept in that package. So when we look at that, we realize, okay, verbalizations are not the most important thing when it comes to communication. There is so many other things that have such greater weight in displaying our desire to connect with someone. And that's a really good thing and a wonderful thing to remember because as persons with dementia start to lose that ability to be verbal, to share in their verbalizations, to be effective in their verbalizations, that does not mean we still cannot understand them. That does not mean we can't step into their space and find a way to connect because we can understand emotion so clearly through body language, tone, and inflection. So we can just scrap the verbalization sometimes and pretend those aren't even there and still get an absolute clear and an opportunity to connect. And to just tail onto what you were saying, there's a cognitive triangle in regards to communicating. And it's, the triangle includes three things, thoughts, emotions, and actions. And a lot of times our thoughts, the things that are going on in our head, become the words that we say. And that's because I think as a society, we tend to just allow our thoughts to fall out of our heads like a gumball out of a gumball machine. And we don't run them through a nice little filter of considering how is this going to sound? What is this going to make the other person feel when I say these things? So it's really important to consider the way in which we think really impacts the emotion and how we share that expression. And those emotions that are going on inside of us based on our thoughts then really do amplify and define how we're going to act, how we're going to provide caregiving. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, an example of that is, well, you know, one of my, one of my, one of the things that that really sparked me into this concept itself was this word noncompliant. Um, I went and saw a speaker in Canada who was an esteemed researcher and gave a lecture and used the word noncompliant to describe persons who are living with dementia. And I was immediately turned off by the use of that word. I found that to be so disrespectful to a person who's living with a cognitive disorder And what it made me realize not only was I started to become angry as I'm listening to the speaker, I also stopped listening to the speaker because I was focusing on my anger. So just in him sharing that word with me, and we're two neurotypical people, I shut down. 
And so I, you can only imagine how the use of a word like that in a community setting where caregivers are using words like non-compliant to describe a patient that they're taking care of, how that's going to really jade how we feel about that person we're caring for and then consequently how we act and provide care for them. You know, it's interesting when you said that word non-compliant, I mean, the hairs just went up on my neck too. And I was just <laughs> like, ah. And, and I mean, I go yeah. on a rant over the use of the word behavior and I would pick the word oh, yeah. behavior um, way over non-compliant because non-compliant to me says um, I'm controlling you, you know? And I mean, it's Absolutely. just, uh, it, it's even a more severe punishment than saying I've got a behavior. Um, and it and it points to that whole criteria base of this is a perfect world and do you fit into it or not? Exactly. And, I'm, and, and life is not perfect. It never has been. And I understand the need for rules, but I think it is so critically important that we that we understand even though the the verbalization of those words is low in terms of um of how we communicate they are still very right. very powerful and so you, you know are, we yeah and so we have to be really aware of that because when we say the word all of those other mm-hmm. things are coming into play our tone of voice you know, our mm-hmm. nonverbals, they're all tied together. We might not realize it. So when you take your reaction, when you take my reaction just to that word, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't watching <laughs> the person. I couldn't see um, any of the nonverbals, and it still got my blood boiling, <laughs> too. So, no, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, because like the, if you can, what we understand as noncompliant in, in, in American culture anyway what that is understood as, as rebellious or disobedient. And, yep. whoa, my God, like it blows my mind to consider the fact that we would ever label a, a, a human being, let alone an elder of ours that we owe utmost of respect to, mm-hmm. that we would actually say that they were behaving, like you're saying, by not conforming to rules and regulations when, in fact, they are, like you said, behaving in a way based solely on the fact that they have a cognitive impairment. Like, yep. they're not 14 and being rebellious against their parents. They're 75 years old and living with a cognitive impairment. And so yep. to, to use that synonym of being rebellious or disobedient, just, it, it, I mean, yeah, talk about blood boiling. That was one. And so you're right, because when we hear that word noncompliant, the next kind of word that, that pops into our head is you're doing this on purpose. Mm-hmm. The act of being noncompliant is a purposeful act. I am pushing against you, essentially, as a teenager would, right? So then mm-hmm. if that thought is you're doing this on purpose, you're not getting into the shower when I ask you to, you're not eating your full meal when I ask you to, and you're doing this on purpose then the emotion that pops into our head right after that is you're making my job harder. When you have that emotion of actually believing your job is harder because someone's being noncompliant, the following action you're going to take is one of punishment. It's going to be where you're punishing that person you're taking care of by really just getting it down to task-centered activities. We're going to do this, then we're going to do that, You know, you're going to act in accordance for the policies I've put in place, and we completely forget the humanity. We completely forget the ability and the desire and the true need to create connection. Yep. Yeah, I I totally, totally get that. You know, noncompliant also, um, to me, it almost, I mean, it's so judgmental. And right away, I mean, I think of of policy, like in communities, the red flags and the tags that they get and, um, you know, from uh, from uh, human services coming in to tell them that they're not doing it right. Um, But it has just as strong um, of an impression in terms of families. And it makes me think of, you know, you've broken the law, that this is a black and white (laughs) thing. And you're going to jail because, again, it, and I loved when you said that it, it reflected like someone has a choice. 
you know, in terms mm-hmm. of this. And yet we don't evaluate and we don't talk about is how the person who is caring for a person can really be the one with the behavior and being non-compliant um, and unflexible. <laughs> And and that's a yeah. conversation that needs to be had because this is not a one way street. Um, just no. as it is with our kids, a lot of times we'll think that they're having a behavior or being non compliant with what we want to do. Um, but many times we step back and go, hey, yeah, they were kind of right. You know, that detour they made us take, and that was a good one. <laughs> you know, we all learned uh-huh. something different and, um, in terms yeah. of really being authentic and being flexible. And again, to me, though, you know, both noncompliant and behavior needs to be changed to reactions and clues for us to dig deeper that something's wrong. You know, when when I when, agree. when there's pushback, there's there's something wrong that they can't communicate in a way that we are used to. That doesn't mean that they're not communicating. It just means we are not looking at the right signs. Exactly. And I think, I think that there is, you know, as I start to share this, this topic with other caregivers, um, personal and professional caregivers, specifically professionals, um, one of the things I bring up is the fact, you know, we've done this in the past. We've been able to recognize that some of the language we use is very stripping of dignity. And Mm -hmm. we have, you know, I've done, I've been in this industry 25 years. We have shifted. We've, we've made a shift. It's unfortunately a slow one, but if you think about, the word bib or the word diaper and Mm -hmm. how those, those words, just those words themselves, those were commonly used 25 years ago when I started in this industry and activities. And when we think about the lack of dignity that provides just by using those words, because someone is going to need more assistance with either urinary incontinence issues or the fact that, they have tremors and are using a spoon and are doing the best that they can, but they can't get the food to their mouth successfully. We have had opportunities where we've learned to shift our language and we've gone from the word diaper to the word undergarment. And just Mm -hmm. in a switch of a word, it provides so much more dignity or the word bib to the word um, clothing protector or dining scarf. You know, mm-hmm. just a shift in the language of the words that we choose can completely shift the way in which we view and provide dignity for mm-hmm. a person they're taking care of. So we've done it. We, we, we've seen small changes in the industry. I think that what we need to do is just continue to push for more aggressive changes and focus, like you're saying, on it's really us that's introducing <laughs> noncompliant behaviors it's us being non-compliant as caregivers. We're the yep. ones that have are setting up policies and expectations without recognizing truly what someone's capable of doing. And then rather than focusing on what they can't do, focusing on what they can do. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about language and, and how we change the way we perceive others, because, you know, it, I don't know. It, it's just such a huge, huge piece. Do you have any suggestions on that? Because the impact is massive. I'm, and I'll use the example of um, my own family where my mom uh, would start calling me her mother or she would call me uh, or she would call my brother her brother. And how mm-hmm. that was perceived, how I perceived it, how my brother perceived it were two totally different things, but it gets back to that internal voice inside. So, you know, how, how does language change the way we perceive others and what they are communicating to us? Wow. Um, Yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to hear more about, you know, how your impression of that was versus your brother. Um, and, and I, I'm going to take a stab that it might just be experience in the field and a, a broader understanding of dementia as a whole and what forms of dementia, what confounds they provide, you know, and, and, and an understanding of that going, okay, she's referring to me as mom. I know I'm not her mom, but there's something about the way in which we're interacting together that's maybe giving her that soothing sense 
of um, parental love or un- unconditional love and respect. And so she's using the word mom, and what she's really conveying is thank you for being there for me because we feel like that oftentimes towards our own mom. Whereas well, someone that, who may be – go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that was exactly it. And she didn't have a good relationship mm-hmm. with her mom, and so somehow that – got healed through our caring relationship. And so to mm-hmm. me, I, I saw that as a gift that how I got to be part of that healing. And it was like, how lucky am I where my brother was like, how can she not know me? And it was all about him. It wasn't about yeah. where, where she was at state of mind. You know, she, in her state of mind, most likely again, we'll never know for sure because she couldn't communicate it. But Um, you know, she was most likely not married, didn't have children, you know, went back in time, which is, you know, pretty standard with a lot of the dementias. And so, um, and and my brother looked like my uncle, you know, and, and he was somebody Mm -hmm. she loved. So to me, that was, oh my gosh, how lucky are you that, you know, she loves you that much. She thinks you're her brother. And and to him, it was offensive. I've been around for 50 years. How can she not remember me? You know, Mm -hmm, and again, mm -hmm. so I think it depends on who you're putting first in terms of where you go with that interpretation and and why would that be? So I I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, no, I think um, there's two things. So, you know, one of them is um, I think it comes from the source of agendas that we often operate from. And and one of the biggest agendas I think family members specifically struggle from is the agenda of expectations. Mm -hmm. Things are supposed to be a certain way. She's going to remember me until she dies. She's going to remember me as her son until she dies. This wasn't supposed to happen to her. Um, She wasn't supposed to age in a way where she doesn't recall me as her son anymore. Whatever the case may be, the patient that we often have, and, and we can all say this, none of us are living the life we thought we'd live you know, when we fantasized at 12, <laughs> our lives are yeah. nowhere near what we thought they were going to be. So we all are dealing with, in every day, in everyday life, dealing with the, the, the disharmony of what we expected our life to be and where mm-hmm. we actually are, kind of like a derailment of a train. And so when someone really struggles, I think, with making peace with that, how far apart our reality is to what our expectations are. When we have a hard time making peace with that, um, two things happen. Number one, anger starts to, to, to brew. You know, it's not, you, we, we focus on, well, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. And the very next thing, the most common thing that happens for humans is when we feel angry about something not going the way we want, our very next jump is to blame somebody else for it. Yeah, it's a very common, just a natural progression of thought is why isn't my life the way it is because of dot, dot, dot. And oftentimes it's so painful to turn that mirror and look at yourself and go, my life isn't the way it is because of choices I made. That's a Mm -hmm. really difficult space to be in. So it's so much easier to to just think to ourselves, my life isn't the way it's supposed to be because of what you did, because of things that are happening to you. And it's that disharmony creates, I think, Mm -hmm. that elicit that anger. And then it's that anger, it's that emotion that is fueling that cognitive triangle of language. I'm angry. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And then that's going to then influence the language that I hear in my own head and the Mm -hmm. language that I share out loud. And then that's going to influence the actions that I take. Well, so, and the other, me, and the, go ahead. The other, the other piece of that too is if I blame you, then I don't have to change. I don't have to take responsibility yes. for what's going on. <laughs> and 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 so many times, I think people aren't even conscious of that's why they're doing yeah. it because they don't want to. You know, when it comes to dementia, you know, it can be painful. You know, loss. It's it's an ambiguous loss throughout the journey, but not just for us who care and love them for for the person diagnosed as well and so many times we don't take that into the equation either oh we do not we do not yeah so 
Um, and it's, it's interesting, too, because you're, you're talking, like, about stages of grief in a lot of ways. And if somebody is still in that space of denial, which is really kind of talking about expectations, you know, this isn't where it's supposed to be, so I'm going to deny that it's happening, that what we're going to do is, is, is we don't take responsibility, you know. And, and yep. the easiest way to not take responsibility is to blame someone else. And so that anger kind of comes out at your mother, who is referring to him as her brother or her uncle. Mm-hmm. Right? No, yeah. and that's where that anger comes from. I think the other thing that's really interesting that you pointed out and that I actually have on my screen that I'm referring to is the concept of, of focusing on language, I think, is a keystone in one of the improv rules that I teach. And that improv rule is called make your partner look good. So mm-hmm. as you were discussing your own personal situation, if our focus is this is about me, then we are never going to work to make our partner look good or feel good because we are focusing on ourselves. But if the yeah. focus is my goal is to make my partner look good, like you stepped into, you saw what was happening as a gift. Mm-hmm. And you volleyed things back and forth with her that made her feel okay. You didn't put her in a place of shame when she referred to you as her own mother. You went along with it. You made your partner look good because that's where she was. And that's because your intention and your focus was to keep her out of shame. And yeah. that's different for other people. So it's, it's, it's keeping that mantra in the back of your mind of how am I communicating and will this help my partner look good? Mm-hmm. Well, and the other thing, I think that people, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people that say, well, I'm not going to lie. You know, and they go back mm-hmm. to the, you know, the golden rule of being honest, which, you know what, guys, I, I believe in honesty, but I also mm-hmm. think there is a level where we have to say, is honesty going to calm the situation or is it going to make it worse? And mm-hmm. if you are agreeing with somebody, even if they're not getting all the facts right, does it really mm-hmm. matter? You know, big picture, you know jump up into the sky, look down, is it really going to matter? Or do you want to be remembered for bringing comfort and calm? Mm -hmm. And again, you don't want to lie just, you know, to try to snake out of things. But when you're dealing with someone who is in cognitive decline, does it really, really matter? Or is your relationship more important? The relationship is obviously number one, and I think you can keep the relationship as priority and not lie at the same time. And here's where the shift in perspective comes. I think a lot of us think that um, we don't want to lie, and so we focus on the words being said. But mm-hmm. I'm not your mother. I'm your daughter, and we, we correct. We focus on the words being said. We can be in agreement 100% with what that person is expressing to us if we don't look so much at the words being said, but the emotion behind the words. Yep. So just like you said, your mom viewed you as her mother, and yep. you took the emotion behind that and found a space to be in agreement with that, that this is an opportunity for you to help her reconnect to uh, right some wrongs to have some closure on some discomfort she had in past relationships. Um, you know, if, if a person says something as simple as, you know, oh, do you see the purple birds in the trees? You know, you can hear in my inflection and my tone, and you can't see my body right now, that what the emotion is, is I'm scared. And mm-hmm. we can be in agreement with emotion 100% of the time. And we are never stepping into a space of lying because there mm-hmm. isn't an emotion that a person with dementia expresses that we ourselves haven't felt. And so if someone is saying to you something that seems a little off in left field, like purple birds in the trees, but we listen to the tone, we listen to the inflection, we look at the body language, we can absolutely be in agreement with all of that. And we can say, wow, that does sound like it's scary to you. I've been scared yeah. of stuff I've seen out in the window. Let's go over here. And so what you are is in 100% agreement and never stepping into a space of lying. You don't mm-hmm. have to say there, there are purple birds in the trees. You can just step into the emotion and be in agreement with that. And then you never have to quarrel with yourself about that moral line. Am I crossing that moral line of lying or not lying? 
It's, mm-hmm. it's looking beyond the words and listening to the emotion and being in agreement with that. You know, I like that. I've, I've never heard anybody articulate it that clearly in terms of aligning with the emotion. And I, I think that that is so precious. I, I know that I have personally met a couple of people that would still say I'm lying because I'm not taking, because I, I'm still in conflict with the word because that's their comfort level. They don't want to go to the emotional side. And yeah. you know, and I get yeah. and I get that too. Um but I think that's a beautiful way to to state it. You know, I would call it as as fiblets and um you know, again keeping keeping the calm and then realizing that when they're calm, it allows you to be calm. And you know, that's a pretty dang huge gift in and of itself instead of swirling in the minutia that you can't always control. And I also loved when you talked about, you know, the, the emotions and being in relationship. I, I'm a, I love the term of relationship based care versus being person centered. I, 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 that, you know, that gets hairs on my, on on my arm um, raised too, because I think that we overstate under deliver and people still don't know what the heck that means. You know, it's about them, but it's not always for them. And there's a big difference yes. there. There's a big difference, yes. I think, in that. Um, yes. And I think, you know, the reality is, and like you're saying, a lot of people don't want to step into the emotions. You know, acknowledging that that's not your strength is a fine place to be. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to defer that to someone else and say, you know, my sister's better at handling these situations than I am. Maybe mm-hmm. that means you're not the primary caregiver. Um, but I think what we have to recognize is caregiving is a conscious choice. We are yep. making a conscious choice to be a caregiver. And when you make that choice, when you're drawn into this profession where you're asked to do this, this work at the end of someone else's life, what you're actually being asked to do is help them write the last chapter. Mm-hmm. And I think what a better, what, 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 what more honor can we ask of someone than to, we've been writing the chapters of our lives every single day that we've lived and now we're 75 and we can't complete this chapter and this book without someone else's help and when they employ you to help them what a beautiful space of honor to be in and so when you focus on that and go the caregiving that i'm giving you is a conscious choice that i'm making to help Mm -hmm. you write your last chapter then you will change your intention of caregiving your intention will be mindful and it will yep. focus, like you, like you said, that relationship. It will focus more on that than the words being said. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask you is for some examples of our willingness to change our language and, and kind of enhance dignity. And I think we already did that. But I, did, I wanted to give you the opportunity if there was another example that you wanted to, to give. Oh, sure. Um, that. Sure. Let me, yeah. Um, I have like a list because I, I, I like to keep lists. Um, I'm a list girl. You know, so too. This is, okay, good. So, um, you know, I think, I think we all know this and I'm sure we've all either seen a Pinterest post or a Facebook post about this concept that, you know, never in the history of the world has the words calm down, help anyone actually calm down. We're in the moment <laughs> when they are in a moment of crisis. Right. And yet yep. we tend to default to these really unhelpful phrases often and I think that there's ways that we can work on rephrasing. Um, and so for that example, if someone who's really working through a moment of crisis and anxiety and we would just say to them, calm down, you know, why not rephrase it and say, how can I help you? Mm-hmm. What can I do to help you? Or, you know, we consider this with a child. You know, this has never worked in my life. I don't know if it's ever worked for anybody else. But when you have a baby crying or a child crying and you say, well, just stop crying, the water works don't just turn off. It's not a magical thing. And so the same thing happens for our older adults. If they're in a moment of real deep sadness or depression and we just say to them, stop crying, it's not effective. But we can say, I can see this is really hard on you. I can see that Mm -hmm. you're really sad. Again, it's making that conscious choice to step into that emotion. Um, Instead of telling somebody you're okay, oh, you're okay. You're fine. Don't worry about it. You hear that kind of platitude in that, in that texture of that, of that, tone um it's asking are you okay and what's interesting is just these three examples right there are instead of just 
operating from our agenda of I need you to get through this so I can mm-hmm. get on with my day, we're yeah. putting that on the shelf and we're, we're changing and shifting to becoming more curious. And I think mm-hmm. that's a key is that caregiving is a mindful act of curiosity. We need to want to be curious about the person that we're taking care of. When mm-hmm. we lose sight of that, our language expresses that. Um, I'm sorry is huge. I have a big soapbox. I like to stand on that about that. I think that the word I'm sorry gets used way too much. Um, I think we use it, we overly use it in in inappropriate ways. And there's a lot of psychology around that term of I'm sorry. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think caregivers, we default to that unknowingly just because in our society, it's an easy way to just kind of check that box and move on. But when it comes to working with somebody who's living with dementia, when we're saying I'm sorry to them, the natural reaction is for that person who's having a difficult time to have to make you feel better. So Mm -hmm. that's really bizarre is like, you know, when we're saying to somebody who's, who's got dementia, oh, I'm sorry, their natural reaction is either going to feel that they've been dismissed and not heard or they're going to feel like they have to make you feel better. No, it's okay, or I'm all right. And so had a lot of heavy lifting on them. And yeah. that's one of those that I, I feel like we really need to kind of squelch out of our um, our vocabulary altogether. I think we need to focus on being much more, much more specifically grateful. Um, when we hear somebody sharing a, difficult, a difficulty with us, instead of just, like I said, checking that box off by saying I'm sorry, we need to recognize that someone has chosen us to share in grief or sadness or fear. They've come mm-hmm. to us because we look like someone they can, we, they can trust. That's a gift. Imagine yep. we don't go to strangers off the street and just start telling them all of our bad news. We specifically choose people in our lives that we know are going to listen, that are, we can trust, that we can cry on their shoulder to. And so if a person with dementia is coming to you, and sharing with you a difficulty, a crisis, even if they can't articulate it beautifully, they're choosing you for a reason. And that's a beautiful thing, an honor, I think, that we should start to take into account. And so instead of saying, I'm sorry, we should be thankful. Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for trusting me with this information. Yeah, I I agree. I also think with uh you know, I'm sorry. I, I agree it's overused. And, um, you know, I'm sorry means nothing if nothing changes, you know. So if they can't mm-hmm. validate the why they're sorry, <laughs> you know, yeah. then really yeah. it's, just, it's just words. And then, you know, what's going to change? But when you were talking about, um, you know, thank you for trusting me, uh, uh, that is massively huge. And then we're really – we're really putting it in a position of honor instead of yeah. oh, what you dump that on me for, you know? Right. Um, right. And again, when someone is telling us something, it doesn't mean we always have to fix it. It's just right. acknowledging and, and being in the moment with somebody and, um, you know, appreciating where, where they are, where they're at. But I think so often we go to, oh, I have to fix it. This is going to be a lot of work. I don't have time. This isn't my responsibility. I mean, we can make a list 10 miles long of excuses, you know, why yeah. we why we do that. And I also think, you know, the discussion that we're having today is really extremely important because what's good for dementia is good for all of our life. So everything we're talking <laughs> about is not dementia-specific, guys. This this works with your kids, with your partners, with your friends, with yourself. Yes. And you can become much more enlightened and a better human being, you know, all the way around. And that doesn't mean you have to get everything we're talking about perfect because I know for myself, I surely don't. And my guess is Kathy doesn't every time either. I do Mm -hmm. not. No, no, no. My husband lets me know every time I don't get it right. But but we are we are aware and we're trying, you know, and that's what I think all we're really asking people is to be open to try and look at things Absolutely. different. And one of the easiest ways I think that can help you position yourself to try is think of the times when you haven't been understood. 
But that and, was and, exactly right. Yep. And wouldn't it have been nice if people around you did some of the things we're talking about today? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and that Absolutely. doesn't that doesn't go away when you have dementia. I think people think so often still there's that negativity and, and, you know, it's all about building awareness that, well, they don't know really what's going on and they can't read all this stuff. But yet Uh if you actually have a conversation with somebody with dementia, they will say they rely on the nonverbals. They rely on the tone and the pitch to help them understand what the heck it is you want from them. Yeah. Yeah. I often refer to persons who are living with dementia as being hyper fluent in body mm -hmm. language. Yep. Yep. They not only utilize it more than we do because oftentimes their own verbalizations fail them, but they're looking at us to know how to be because this yep. is a whole new perspective for them to be living in. If it's community or in someone else's home, it's mm-hmm. the first time they've ever done this. And so they're looking at how to be and they're looking for us as those examples. Exactly. Exactly. Um, gosh, I can't believe how much time is flying here. <laughs> we, we just we only have like 13 minutes left. And I mean, I could just talk to you all day. What about um, how our language translates um, to in, the, your improv rules? And how can that, you know, help um, care partners um, make a person with dementia feel more comfortable, you know, and again, it doesn't have this, this overlays all boundaries of all people. Um, but our primary focus is dementia today. So um, I know we touched on it a little bit, but let's, let's dive a little bit deeper when well, we've got a few minutes sure. left here. So I think one of the things that's very near and dear to my heart, because I've worked a lot of, in a lot of different settings and community settings. Um, one of the things that always struck out to me is how we, share our experience during our eight hour shift with the person coming in to relieve us. And Mm -hmm. one of the things, and this is how it, uh, this is how it ties back to the improv rule of make your partner look good is we're, we're passing information on from care partner to care partner. That might be from CNA to CNA or nurse to nurse or sister to daughter, whoever those, those partners come in that kind of relieve us. And when we kind of give that, that lowdown of what happened today, that, that, you know, end of shift report, as you will, Um, I think a lot of times the language that we use to convey what our experience has been as a caregiver for the last eight hours or so can completely jade the way the next caregiver comes in and thinks, speaks, and acts towards Mm -hmm. that person with with dementia. So, for example, when we are using the terminology that's pretty common today, Um, that describe the, what I hate to, the word, the behaviors that people experience, we would just, you you often will hear a staff member say, so-and-so was wandering or hoarding, or they were aggressive. They've been rummaging. Um, They've been very repetitive today. And so when we hear those words, if um, my, my coworker shares that language with me, it is a known fact that by hearing those words, those are the words I'm going to take on and those are the blinders I'm going to use in my no eight-hour shift. And so when mm-hmm. I see Mr. Johnson, I'm going to be looking for evidence of wandering, hoarding, aggressiveness, rummaging, these types of things. And we're going to, like, see things through that rosy-colored glass rather than for what they truly are. We're going to see mm-hmm. them for what we want to see, not necessarily for what it is. And that Mm -hmm. can cause harm because then it disallows a fresh caregiver to come in with an opportunity to create new perspectives and create new concepts as to what might be going on. They've been given essentially limitations. Here's how you need to think about Mrs. Johnson for the next eight hours because this is how I experienced her. Mm -hmm. And so – Again, it is as much as we say words don't matter, words do matter. And they, I think, do matter more in the caregiving realm because we can say to, we can say to the CNA, um, you know, so-and-so Mrs. Johnson was wandering a lot today. Or we could say Mrs. Johnson is almost got her 10,000 steps in. I mean, just the language shift in that is like good for her. And I got to yep. get my steps 
Johnson. So if I see Mrs. Johnson walking down the hall, I'm probably going to join her. And I'm going to mm-hmm. set my watch. And I'm going to see how many steps I can get with her. Or, mm-hmm. you know, and like you said, this isn't just about dementia, but it is someone who's hoarding. Maybe they're a collector. Maybe they're accumulating treasures. Uh, my son has autism. I believe he, he does have a tendency to, I guess, use the word hoard. But I never say that word to him. In fact, I call him my magpie. And he loves that. He's 21, and he loves that I have this little nickname for him because magpies are just this awesome bird that have the tendency to collect shiny things. And so Mm -hmm. he actually wears that title with pride. Um, Somebody who's rummaging, they're physically exploring their environment. Perhaps there's somebody who learns and understands and is getting information because they're a tactile learner. Not because they're rummaging to be non-compliant or, you know, cause you to have to do more work. It's a Mm -hmm. shift in the language that then shifts the way we look at what they're doing. And it shifts it in a positive way. Instead of wandering, they're getting their steps in. Hey, yeah, aren't we all supposed to get 10,000 steps in? Instead of hoarding, are they accumulating treasures? Are they someone who sees value in things, you know, what's what man's, one man's trash is another man's treasure. You know, that's yep. a gift. To run it, yep. to physically explore. Now I understand how you understand your environment better. That's mm-hmm. a great gift to us to go, oh, this person who specifically likes to um, physically explore their environment, I know that they get a lot of information from their hands. As their progression of dementia goes on, I can remember this. And we'll do yep. more things that are tactile with them. So it is, it is truly, it breathes life into that rule of improv because the only way we can make our partners look good in a lot of ways is the way in which we change our language and then the way in which we change the sharing of that language with that next care partner stepping in to give us help because yep. we open up perspectives. Exactly. Exactly. No, I think that that is, um, that is brilliant, you know, and like Alzheimer's Speaks, I mean, I started that to, um, to give people different platforms to learn. And we all know everybody learns different, but we don't, we don't really process what that means. And I think it's, right. it, it's very important on every level of our relationships to understand that people don't see and feel and and react exactly as we do. You know, they're they're built a little different. Their experiences are a little bit different. They're wired differently. And and that's not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. And and being right. able to accept that makes life a lot easier for everybody. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. On that. What about some useful rephrasing and reframing things that are actionable for, for our listeners? Okay, so, um, you know, when it comes to rephrasing, so I'm, I'm all about when it comes to improv rules, you know, they say when the rubber hits the road is the rule, yes, and. That's, that's mm-hmm. an improv rule. That's the golden rule of improv. Um, and as we talked about, you know, sometimes it's not about being in agreement with the words because we don't want to lie. It's being in agreement with the emotion. Um, mm-hmm. But there's ways that you can say yes and be in agreement with what somebody is showing you, uh, you know, the scary purple birds that they see in the tree. Um, you can say things like, oh, my God, you're so right. And we don't have to say you're so right there are purple birds in the trees. You can just say, oh, my God, you're so right, and then be in agreement with the emotion. Or definitely, of course, um, I hear what you're saying. You seem to be saying that you're scared. Um, it sounds like you see purple birds in the trees. So mm-hmm. it's really even just the gift of rephrasing what that person says to you mm-hmm. kind of gives you an opportunity to get a little bit more information. So the, the, the concept of just rephrasing in itself and rephrasing it as a question mm-hmm. really provides the caregiver with an opportunity to number one, buy a little bit of time to process, you know, cause we all need a little bit of time to process when somebody throws yep. something coming from left field. But it also gives that person that's living with dementia an opportunity to maybe give us a little bit more to go on. So we mm-hmm. know now, okay, you're guiding me. And so 
oh, my God, I see the purple birds in the trees. And, and uh, if I were to re- approach them, I'd say, so, so what you're saying is you see scary birds in the trees? You see something in the tree that's scaring you? I'm just rephrasing it back. And nothing feels better to people. And nothing gives anyone a sense of being heard more than when they o- hear their own words said back to them. That is Very such true. a sense of respect. Right. Like we all feel yep. really good. If you can repeat back to me what I just said, then I know you heard me. Right. Yep. So rephrasing gives that person that sense that you've heard me and you're actually mm-hmm. interested. And so most likely they go, yes, the purple birds or that tree or something scaring me. They're going to give you a little bit more to go on. And that's mm-hmm. beautiful for all of us as caregivers. We need more of those gifts. Um, you know, when it comes to. Let's see. Uh, let's look at this one here. Oh, that's where I'm at right now. I'm like, I'm looking at my PowerPoint with all my little lists. Um, like I said, you know, wandering, is it getting steps in? Um, mm-hmm. When someone's aggressive, the reality is, and, and this is how I kind of look at this, it's the way in which we would write a resume for a person mm-hmm. living with dementia, right? We could take the way in which they act and react to their environment and write it as we see it. And it wouldn't be very positive at all and probably would not help that person get the job they're applying for. But as you and I and all of us as as adult caregivers and, you know, adult children of of persons with dementia, you know, we know how to rephrase. (laughs) We're very good at this. We just choose not to use it with our adult, you know, our adults or the persons living with dementia. So if you take your own weaknesses when you're creating your resume and you go, okay, I am a very aggressive person by nature, right? But how can I reword that to sound really good in a resume? I can say that I'm very good at expressing my needs. I'm bold and I'm feisty and I'm passionate, Mm -hmm. right? So why not just take the words that are in our minds in regards to what we see in an instant and think about how would I reword this in a resume? Mm -hmm. So somebody who has a verb... Yeah, somebody who has verbal outbursts, right, um, the uncontrollable verbal outbursts, you know, there's somebody who's very good at displaying a surge of frustration, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what they're doing right now. They're, they're displaying some frustrations that they have, and they're using a verbal outburst or a verbalization to do that. It's a so much more positive language to use. Um, you know, oh, goodness, I have another list up here. Let's see. We have about two minutes left, so. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, You know, this is like one of my favorite ones. I think a lot of caregivers default to, well, I told you this five minutes ago. I explained this to you yesterday, (laughs) right? Okay. Uh, You know, what about just rephrasing it? Maybe I can show you another way. Maybe we can Mm -hmm. try something new. It's, It's not a blame, not I told you this is your problem, but maybe I should do something different. And so it's taking the onus on as yourself, being introspective that your goal is to create that relationship, contain that relationship, and commit to that relationship as being priority. Wonderful. Um, I, I just, like I said, I could talk with you all day long, Kathy. This has just been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I want to make sure that we get your contact information out to our listeners. Uh, Kathy has a wonderful site called Improv, the number four, um, improv4caregivers.com, improv4caregivers.com. Uh, and again, that's the number four. You can also email her at improv for caregivers at gmail.com, improv for caregivers at gmail.com. She's on uh, Facebook and also on uh, Instagram, again, for improv for caregivers. Can you, in um, like 30 seconds, tell people about Beautiful Failure Fridays on Facebook? Oh, sure. <laughs> so every Friday I do like anywhere from like a five to 10 minute quick video. And I, um, I, it's up from the cuff. I don't, I don't, I don't rehearse because improv is the key. Um, but usually on Thursdays, like today, I focus on 
something that I really screwed up on in the week in regards to communication because of social distancing tends to be something that happens within the household, whether it's with my husband or my son or my daughter. And I reflect on a mistake that I've made in communication, whether I used the wrong tone or I did use a word that was more accusatory. And then I focus on what that did in our uh, kind of volley back and forth. Did it create an argument? What did it do? How did I feel? How did they feel? And how did we resolve it? And I just talk about the, the, the mistakes that I make in communication because I want to be, I'm going to walk the walk and talk the talk. And right. I talk about then the gift that I learned. Thank you so much, Kathy. Appreciate it very much. And I can't wait to have you back on the show. Take care, everyone. We will talk soon. Bye now. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.